All right, folks, and welcome to our stock analysis session on Zoom. I'm actually very excited to be hosting today's workshop. It's been a while since we've done something like this, but I want to break it into three parts so that it's easy to navigate. And the first one is going to be, as you're seeing here uh, on my screen, and I, I just want to make sure, can you guys also see my screen? If you can see the screen, just type yes. That will also help from a technical standpoint. Good, so you guys can see it as well. All right, uh, and the way we're gonna do it is first go over Zoom, right? How do you do some sort of diagnostics uh, in a stock, right? Or, or stock diagnosis, if you will, in terms of helping you determine is the stock a buy or a sell like you're seeing here on point number two. And then after that, I wanna dive a little bit more into our analyst education so that you can learn more of the technical skills so that you are better trained, you have the proper skills so that you could do this on your own. And from there, then actually take a look at the stock and, and maybe give you a little bit more insight into other uh, tools that you can perhaps invest as, uh, as an alternative from stocks, right? Buying directly soon stock, what's another alternative that can potentially give you um, a higher rate of return? And, and, and for those of you that stay on the call towards the end, I'm gonna show you what that looks like. And that is looking at the options market. So I'll leave that as a bonus for those of you that stay um, at the end, okay? So let's start with number one, which is really performance uh, our stock analysis and, and really understanding the situation. So the first thing that usually you would want to do is understand the story of the company. And the easiest way to really understand that is by looking at the stock price. I'm annotating right here, Pinterest. This should be actually Zoom. So let's change. This is one of the other stocks in the previous bubble that we just experienced. Um, I call it the pandemic bubble right after the Fed and Congress passed trillions of dollars to inflate um, the market so that they can stimulate it due to the pandemic. But as I'm illustrating right here on my screen, you can see that we have Zoom. Uh, during the pandemic, the stock increased approximately 500%. But since the pandemic, the stock has decreased approximately over 80%, we can say, right? It's the boom and bust cycle. Now, the question that I would ask you to consider when you see this is what happened during the boom period, okay? And then what happened during the bust period? Imagine the investor pool that bought the stock up here. Imagine how many retail investors bought Zoom and are now sitting on a position that is underwater by 80%. So what, it, what are the steps? What are the key information to be aware of so that you're not the one stuck buying stocks at the highs and you can perhaps buy at the beginning of a major move to the upside where you are actually anticipating things, okay? So part of the story is during the pandemic, the economy was shut down, right? You, you, you couldn't go out, things were on lockdown. And the new norm of communication was through this format, right? Video conferencing. And Zoom had their own product. So because of the economic condition, there was high demand for Zoom product. And therefore, they began to monetize part of the premium services that they're offering in their product. And you got to see revenue increase by triple digits. And I'm going to pull up the financial so that you can see what that looks like. So as part of the story, many sophisticated investors that understand these scenarios, they were buying in in January or February, you could see the price action at the bottom on a month by month basis. So they were anticipating higher revenue growth. Okay. These are the key financial indicators to pay attention to. So they were experiencing or anticipating higher revenue growth, expansion on margins, higher earnings per share growth, free cash flow of the business. Okay. So those, those were the financial conditions that were, that was a result of the economic environment and Zoom having the right product at the right time. And those were all of the ingredients that you basically needed to create a stock that went from $70 a share at the beginning of January of 2020 to an all-time high of approximately $588 in October of 2020. 
Okay. And then of course, as the economy reopened, as more people started to go outside, we got some sense of normality. Zoom stock essentially dropped, right? And you get to see that also in the financials. So when we're talking about understanding a stock, number one, look at the stock price, look at a two, three, four year time frame, and take a look at the return. Is the stock up year today? Is it down year today? And then try to uncover the story. Everything when it comes down to stock analysis has a story behind it. And one of your jobs is to understand and learn the story. Now, where can you find information on finding the story? Well, simple. Go to the company website and under the investors relations section, look at the press releases that the company has been issuing, look at their earnings report and listen to the language and the information that the company is reporting. So let's take a look at the numbers, okay? So number one, we took a look at the stock and we see that the stock increased 500% during the boom period when we had a shutdown economy, everyone was in lockdown, stay at home. And after the economy began to reopen, the stock declined approximately 80%. Later, we're gonna answer the question, is this a buying opportunity? And we're gonna perform uh, 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 some level of analysis on a trading side, looking at sales multiples. And then of course, I'm gonna give you a little bit more of what a full blown analysis on a company like Zoom would really look like, okay? So let me pull up here our spreadsheet. Here it is, okay? And let's change tabs here. So what I'm showing right here are trading multiples, trading comparables on other companies that could be direct competitors or indirect competition to Zoom. And professional analysts or professional investors, they pay very close attention to these three types of multiples, revenue multiples, okay, EBITDA multiples, and PE multiples. And notice that Zoom at the moment, right, on the sales basis is trading above the mean and median. Let, take a look at on an EBITDA basis. They're trading at the medium range, which is the low end of this range right here. And then on a PE multiple basis, the stock is basically trading below the industry average. So what stands out to me is these two, revenue multiple and the PE multiple. They are both outside the ranges. So then you have to question or ask yourself, is this an investment opportunity? Is Zoom overvalued on a revenue front if we compare EBITDA to, to sales? Or is Zoom undervalued on a PE multiple basis? Okay. And again, we're being very objective here by looking now at trading multiples, right? Business usually trade on, on a EBITDA or sales basis, depending on if it's on a technology company, an industrial company, and also is the, is, is the company profitable? If the company is not profitable, that means they'll have a negative PE, they'll have negative net income, they'll have negative EBITDA. So in the absence of EBITDA, PE, or net income, then we will focus on revenue multiple, like most growth tech stocks. If they are profitable, then we can look at EBITDA and PE multiple. And then to some extent, to some extent, you can also use free cash flow as a multiple, which we don't have right here, but I'm letting you know that some investors also look at free cash flow multiples too to evaluate businesses. So we know where these multiples are at. And I'm going to use later the sales multiple to come up to uh, to come up with an implied price target on soon to help me determine if it uh, is it a good buying opportunity, is it overvalue or undervalue. So I'm going to use these multiples um, down the line so that we can answer that question. So trading multiples, very, very important. Now, let's take a look quickly here. I'm going to pull up the financials of Zoom using Thompson One, which is, let's pull it up right here. Actually, Capital IQ will give us that information. And for those of you that are in our analyst program, you know, when you're part of the program under your internship experience, you get access to these financials when I staff you in a project. So for example, here is Zoom's 
financial. Let me maximize this. Take a look at the growth that Zoom experienced on revenue, top line, as you see right here. And look at the growth from 2020 to 2021. Revenue increased by 88% from 2019 to 2020. But look at the growth in 2021, 325%. Now, if you take a look at the stock price and the performance of the stock price, it ran up in anticipation of that high revenue growth rate because of the conditions in the economy. So if you're, if you're able to really understand an industry or a sector that is benefiting from whatever challenge that we might be experiencing in the economy, Look at the product and service. And if that product and service is, is in high demand because of economic conditions, you can anticipate six to 12 months that revenue will probably be in the high double digit range. In the case of Zoom, it was three, uh, 325%. So that's another observation to write down as a note that High revenue growth coincides with a stock that's also going to increase one, two, or, or, or three X in a very short period of time. But then look what happened after. Look at the rate of revenue growth, 54%, but the rate of revenue growth declined. Then on an LTM basis, see, it also declined. Look at 2023, it also declined. Look at 2024, now it's 13%. Look at 2025, 10%, now it's lower. So you have to ask yourself as an investor, will you pay a sales multiple of double digit for a company that is no longer growing above, let's see here, above 88%? That's the question that usually smart investors, whether you are on the buy side at a hedge fund or even at a mutual fund, like a Fidelity as a portfolio manager, you're asking yourself those type of questions to determine if a stock it's expensive or cheap. And that's one of the questions that we're going to try to answer. If Zoom is going to be growing revenue below 20%, basically close to uh, low teens over the next three years, what would be an appropriate multiple? And then what would be the implied stock price? So this is using the financials now to do a deeper dive into understanding the story of the business, okay? Now let's go a little bit deeper here. Let's look at levels of profitability, which is down here. And I, I really care mostly about EBITDA because this is your proxy for um, cash flow. Okay, it's an estimation of how much operating cash flow the company is generating. In the analyst program, if you guys you know complete your business fundamentals module, you'll know how to read a cash flow statement, and you will understand what a uh, operating free cash flow means. But take a look at their EBITDA margin. They've been profitable, okay? In the early years that I'm seeing right here, very low single digit. But as soon as revenue exploded to the upside, like in 2021, look at EBITDA. Look at the margin as a percentage of revenue, increased 26%. And beyond that, margins are actually expanding. So even though the revenue, the, uh, the rate of growth for revenue is declining to low teens, EBITDA margin is expanding. So that's another variable to take into account. If revenue growth is declining, but EBITDA margin is expanding, does the company deserve a premium? If we look at their EBITDA multiple, does the EBITDA multiple deserve a premium because they're becoming more profitable? So those are some of the questions that you know, our professional analysts wrestle with when they're looking at this type of analysis. And then the final point that I'll look at is my earnings per share growth, okay? Look at this right here. Look how fast earnings per share grew in 2021, 2,500%. The previous year was $0.09. Cents. Then the following year, it increased $2 and uh, to, it increased uh, about, let's say, $2 uh, and change, but from a percentage standpoint, 2,500%. Then it doubled in 2022, then it increased by 42% um, so far year to date on, on a 2022 basis. But look, the market is expecting a decline. And look at the EPS growth going forward, single digits. So the financial profile of Zoom, the way I would conclude it is that 
During the pandemic, it was a growth story. After the pandemic, post-pandemic, it, is, it has become a more mature, profitable company with increased free cash flow and, and higher free cash flow yield. But the revenue growth rate is now in the lower teens. I don't think Zoom deserves a high multiple, given the future financial picture um, that this is presenting. So if we look at the multiples, right, of Zoom, historically, what does that look like, right? What was the market paying for Zoom on a sales and EBITDA basis back in 2020? That's a very important question. And we have that information right here, right? And this is all part of analyzing the stock. See, right here. Enterprise value over total revenue. And if you take one thing away from here, is to learn how to analyze company on a multiple basis, on a sales multiple basis and on an EBITDA basis, okay? Very important point that you understand that because in the world of investment banking, when they're buying and selling businesses and they do their free cash flow analysis, they do their discounted cash flow um, valuation ranges, ultimately what the buyer is looking at, how much of an EBITDA am I paying for this company on a multiple standpoint, right? How much of a sales multiple am I paying for this business? So understand that multiples typically dictate the value of a company. And then the value of those multiples really comes down to the cash flow generation of that business. So look where this stock was trading at. Look at this sales multiple. 113 times. 113 times. And look where the multiple is at today. Right. Let me zoom out a little bit. Here's the multiple. The multiple is in the single digits. It's right here. That multiple right now is about six times as you got to see. So for those of you that are right here participating, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think, given the financial profile that I just shared with you on Zoom, do you think Zoom will recover back and get to trade at 113 times into the future? That's a yes or no question. What do you guys think? Okay. No. Okay. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Okay. No, you, uh, I see there Ulysses no as well. Okay. Yay. No. Okay. Okay. So chances are that they're not going to get to trade. And, and from my own perspective as well, chances are that they're not going to get to trade um, at 113 times sales unless, unless the growth rate, the revenue growth, right? I'm just going to abbreviate this, is greater than 200%. If the company's growing revenue triple digits 200% or so, then you can experience this. So you can say that the multiple that the market pays for a company is a function of the growth rate on revenues. Okay. So that's important to, to understand this. All right. On an EBITDA basis, because we also looked at EBITDA and the profitability of, of EBITDA uh, from a margin standpoint. Here's EBITDA. Here is the graph. Let me zoom in a little bit on this. Okay. And when the stock came public, right? Notice that you don't see any chart or price action history, right? Because Zoom actually, uh, one, they were not profitable, but then they did an IPO, I think, in 2019. And I guess they were not tracking total enterprise value over EBITDA. But take a look at the highs, right? These guys had an EBITDA multiple between 238 times and 288 times. That was their EBITDA multiple. And since the multiple has basically gone below 38 times, I mean, this multiple is around 20, uh, 24 times, like we got to see previously on, on this training multiple slide. What is it right now? It's 24 times right now. Sales is 6.7. So let's go back to this EBITDA level, okay? So you can ask yourself the same question, right? Will EBITDA multiple, would it come to the 200 range sometime in the future? Well, obviously the financial profile needs to improve, but can you anticipate a multiple increase on the stock of maybe 20, 30% or maybe the multiple can double where it's trading at around 50X? That could be a possibility. That could be a possibility. So then what would the stock price be? 
with a new sales multiple of let's say 10 times or 20 times. So now you begin to apply a little bit more of technical uh, analysis where you're applying your sales multiple. If you're a little bit more sophisticated, you could do a discounted cash flow analysis, put together an entire financial model and project the cash flows that the business is going to generate and discount it to the present time using your WAC rate. So let's do a very simplistic example using sales multiple. So this is a very back of the envelope, preliminary valuation on Zoom, simply using sales, right? We can use sales or we can use PE multiples. So let's first go through the sales process so that you can understand how we come up with price targets using just sales multiple, okay? So at the top line, what do we have? Road number eight, we have revenue or sales for Zoom. And you can see the growth rate uh, beyond 2022, 2023, 24, and 25. We also have earnings per share. And notice that the stock, I believe as of today's close, it was at $111. So let's change this. This is today's close, 111.87. There it is. Okay. And the multiple that the company currently has is this, 6.7. So we're going to take this multiple. How do you calculate that multiple? Well, it's simple. You take the company's enterprise value. And enterprise value takes into account equity, cash, debt, and it gives you the full value of the business that is currently traded on the market. That's really what the enterprise value um, reflects. And then you take the enterprise value divided by your sales, and that's how we come up with that multiple. One factor that I like to look at to determine if the multiple is uh, it's appropriate is doing this, what I've illustrated right here on road 15. And what this represents is, is my sales multiple to grow? If it's one, it means that the stock on a sales multiple basis is fully valued. If it's below one, it's undervalued. If it's above one, it's overvalued. That's essentially what this is saying. And the argument is that the market should pay in the form of a sales growth, right? Uh, or, or, or in other words, the multiple, the sales multiple that the company has should be reflected of the growth rate that revenue is generating. In other words, if revenue is growing by 10%, then the sales multiple should be 10x. If the sales growth of the company is 20%, then the sales multiple should be 20x. And when you back solve for your um, sales growth to multiple calculation, you should have one. And that's exactly what I'm doing with this formula. So right now, it's not one. The stock is under value on a sales multiple basis. So what would be the stock price if we basically kind of you know, do this? If we take 2023 full year revenue, right? What are they expected to generate over the next uh, 12 months, if you will? What is the growth rate? We, cap, we back off, we calculate the enterprise value. We adjust for, for cash. We adjust for debt. We get an implied net debt. We subtract net debt from enterprise value, okay? We end up with our own equity value of the business, divide that by the shares outstanding. And what do we get? We get an implied stock price. So given that the stock or the company will be earning or generating 4.5 billion in revenue at a 6.7 sales multiple, your price target should be probably around 121. $121, which essentially represents 8% from the current stock price. If we fast forward to 2025, if you have a longer term time horizon, like a 24 months or a five-year holding period, then you could probably expect, again, if they generate $5.7 billion in revenue, if you think the market will continue to pay that 6.7 sales multiple, then you can expect a price target of around $147. This is assuming the current sales multiple. 
I believe that when tech becomes into favor, when there is a sector rotation in the market, when the Fed stops raising interest rate and technology stocks come back into favor, in that scenario, I believe that the market will pay a higher premium for soon sales growth. So what would be the multiple, right? that the market will have to pay in order for row 15 to be one. Obviously, you'll probably be doubling this. So let's uh, play with that scenario. So let's assume that the growth rate that you're seeing right here in row nine will become the multiple. So I'm going to change this. I'm going to do a quick back of the envelope calculation. So I'm going to do equals. I'm going to take my growth rate and I'm going to multiply it by 100. And here's the multiple. And the multiple would give me basically one to one, almost one to one. Then what will be the stock price if the market is paying the growth rate of revenue in the form of a multiple? Now look at the stock price. It's much higher. And you're looking at a potential investment return of about 100% three, four years out from now. And this is very simple, very back of uh, the envelope calculation. Now. We can be a little bit more in depth by doing an entire model and building a discounted cash flow analysis um, on this company to compare if the DCF analysis is in line with this $225 price target, assuming that the stock will earn or generate $5.7 billion in revenue. Okay. And this is very, very important. So this analysis helps me when it comes down to answering the question that I had said as part of our agenda, is Zoom stock a buy or is it a sell? Based on this analysis, I will say yes. But that's just one of the variables or one of the diagnostics that we're doing or one of the analysis that we're performing to help us answer that question. For those of you that are in our analyst spread program, under the internship, I make you... As part, uh, I give you as part of your responsibility, perform a discounted cash flow analysis, perform PE and EBITDA uh, valuation, where we would arrive to a price target using those on metrics as well. And then, I, of course, I have you build the entire financial model also. Okay. Now, if we go back and look at the stock chart of Zoom, something very, very important happened. I'm going to add it to this chart right here. And I'm going to change the time frame to a daily time frame. Let me remove this. And this is also very, very important for you to understand is this. So Zoom most recently reported, I believe their second or third quarter earnings. I mean, we can pull up their website and we can take a look at the earnings report. But look what happened. See right here, right at the bottom of this uh, candle, this, this is just um, candlesticks. I'm rep uh, representing the price action of Zoom in the form of candlestick. At the bottom, it's volume. This is the amount of shares that was bought and sold on that specific date. If the volume bar is green, it means that the stock price was up on that day, which represents that there was a buyer. If the volume bar is red, it means that the stock closed down on the day, but there was price action. There was uh, uh, the number of buyers and sellers or transaction or shares that exchanged at hand is reflected at the bottom. Notice that when they reported earnings, someone came in here on that day and accumulated roughly, wow, so 27.2 20, million shares exchanged hands on that day, May 24. Why is that? And that was the day after earnings. Is that a big institutional investor performing the same level of analysis that I'm actually performing right here? And of course, they have you know, a lot more resources than we have as retail investors. And maybe they have an army of analysts going deeper into their pricing model, the features that they're adding, their marketing strategy, their free cash flow. And they are placing a very significant bet on how the stock may perform 12, 24 uh, months from now, or maybe three or four years. They're probably placing a bet that the stock will probably double 
um, during the next two or three years based on the numbers that we've looked at. But to give you a little bit more confidence, go to the company's website. And again, this is very practical. What I'm sharing with you right here, where you will go to the company's website, typically all the way at the bottom, under the about us section, there'll be something known as investors. See right here, investors, right underneath partners. You click on that. And then we get to see their investors relation part of their website. And I care about their most recent quarterly report. So Zoom fiscal 2022 letter to shareholders, Zoom ESG report. Okay. Uh, what about earnings? Let's see. Let me look at financial data, news, management, ESG responsibility, resources, mm, press release. Is there a library of, here, press release, here all the way at the top, on the left-hand side, news event press release. Let me click on press release. And I care about earnings. Let me see if there is a earnings press release. Ah, there it is. So on May 23rd, they reported first quarter earnings. What happened on May 24th? Let's go back to the chart. And this is basically comparing the annotation. See right there? The they reported earnings May 23rd. Then on the following day, the stock increased and someone came in and probably accumulated 27 million shares. I mean, you could, do the, you could do the math on that. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that is pouring into this stock, okay? Read the earnings report. Look at revenue. So first quarter total revenue of a billion, up 12% year over year. Um, first quarter gap margins up, 17% non-gap, 37%. Okay, that's good. Uh, net cash flow from operating activities was closely half a billion dollars, a 49% margin. And number of customers contributing more than 100,000 in trailing 12 months revenue up 46% year over year. Okay, not bad. So for the quarter, strong quarter, the company's still growing. It's a profitable business. And if you perform the analysis that I recently just performed, this stock has a potential of maybe doubling from here, right? If you look at 2023, revenue of uh, 4.4 revenue, billion, and you apply a 10X or 11 times multiple, the stock can simply increase by 64% within perhaps the next six to 12 months. If you look at 2024, you can expect perhaps a stock price of $205. If you look at 2025, now you're looking at a stock that can double by 100%. Now, what is the main catalyst? The general market. This is why understanding the economic environment, understanding interest rate cycle, understanding sector rotation is so important because right now tech is really not in favor. However, you're starting to see big institutional investors accumulating shares in their most recent earnings report. These are the clues that to the untrained eye will not be able to recognize it. But for those of you that are in our analyst program, within the stock curriculum that we've provided you with, you'll be able to see this because we give you dozens of examples on how to recognize this, okay? And then this takes me to another very important point. And this is all part of a series of articles that we've created you know, on, on our own website that tells the story on how stocks behave. So for those of you that are new, is it, this is an introduction. You, know, you can easily go to our website, Romero Mentoring, go under articles. If you scroll down, you're gonna see a thumbnail or the title of an article called Strategic Stock Phase Model. If I click on this, you're gonna see phase one, two, three, and four. And stock moves in cycles, they move in waves, they move in pattern. And I explain what each one of these phases look like. So you can see right here, the screenshot that, that I've um, included, right? You have the beginning period, which is the accumulation period. It's not a popular stock. It's not hot. No one really knows about it. Then you have the confirmation period, which is when they report better than expected earnings. And that is an announcement where big institutional investors begin to notice and they start accumulating shares. 
Then you have phase three, which is typically the promotion phase because the media is paying attention to, to the stock. They're starting to write about it. The Wall Street Journal talks about it. Bloomberg talks about it. CNBC talks about it. And their audience is in the hundreds of millions of market participants. So once you have the news hit the, let's say, media promotion marketing machine, what do you think is going to happen to the stock? Well, people are going to start buying the stock. And then I call the fourth phase, the mania and panic phase, which is exactly what you got to see with Zoom, okay? So now we're beginning, I believe we're beginning this whole cycle again, right? I believe the stock will probably, you know, remain in this flat range for the remainder of 2022. And if tech becomes hot again, if tech becomes uh, a, a sector that's in favor, you could expect that Zoom can probably rally and double from this point. And then we go through that same um, cycle again. So right now, look at the increase in volume. This is the accumulation phase. If I share again, the table showcasing it, right? You can see that that's exactly what we're doing is the accumulation phase where market participants that are doing their research and their analysis and see a good quarter, they're going to come in and, and, and accumulate shares so that six, 12 months from now, when other market participants begin to see that Zoom is generating free cash flow, they're profitable, um, they're probably going to start to buy more shares into this name because they're probably going to say, hey, this stock is undervalued and we need to have it in our portfolio. And mutual funds, if they're underweight the stock, they're going to have to start buying it. So you are anticipating the next cycle of what's coming, okay? With that being said, I would like to open it up to any questions that you guys may have, okay? I wanted to give you some context in the sense of using sales multiples to come up with an implied share price, give you context in terms of the competition and how we measure or evaluate these trading multiples, also show you how the stock has traded historically on a sales multiple basis, okay? And also on an EBITDA basis, and just give you some practical application to using you know this methodology to come up with price targets so with that being said you know i'll open it up to any questions that any of you guys may have and for those of you that are in the analyst prep program you're expected to do this type of work under our internship okay any questions on any of this yep it's 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 yeah it's it's being recorded and we'll we'll definitely share with you um, once it's available so that you can replay it and you can rewatch it. Okay. Where, what's the analyst prep program? Okay. Well, you can easily access it on our website um, here. Let me pull it up quickly. All right. You can just go to our landing page and on the career program, analyst prep program, right? You'll get a lot of valuable information here. Um, and you can also check out any one of our starter programs, which is um, more self-paced, self-study, um, just to give you an introduction into some of the technical skills that, that we cover to, to help you improve and develop um, your professional skill set. All right. Let's see. Uh, we have another one. How do you assign weights for each of these different methods valuing stock price up? Uh, Brian, that's a good question. That's a really good question. So let me give you an example on an actual company that we had interns do the entire analysis. So this is what our interns do in our program. This is a full blown model um, that they complete once they complete our program and, and, and they're doing our internship. So here's their income statement. Here is revenue breakdown, depreciation schedule, different scenarios, Wall Street estimates. Here's comparable company analysis. Here's training multiple valuation. Here's the discounted cash analysis. And then here is all of the different valuation methodologies with, let me change the color of this so that it's not a distraction, okay? With different valuation ranges. You have low and high valuation ranges. So the way we do it, we would take the mean and median of all of those valuation ranges. 
And once we have a range, we will look at where the stock is at. Is the stock trading at the low end of the, of the range or at the high end of the range? Or is it outside of those ranges? Is it, is, is it out of whack? This is how we do it traditionally um, within investment banks. This is how also they do it. This is part of our methodology. Now, there are some investors, some hedge funds that would give a higher weight to a trading multiple valuation than a DCF valuation. And they would just put a certain percentages. Um, that's more proprietary. And that's also based on the analyst's own view of the company. And they might have their own criteria on how they apply um, different percentages to weight their valuation. I don't do that. I like to take the mean and median of all of the valuation ranges because I believe the multiples that we apply to the business when we're trying to calculate an implied share price should reflect whatever percentages you may want to give to any different methodology. So it's not an exact science. It's an art. But this is how I apply weight to all of these different valuation methodologies. And by the way, this model, this was for Apple. And if you see for Apple, we have it right here. Okay. You have the stock price of Apple. Okay. At the time we did this, the stock was trading at 158. The high valuation range, it's $185. The low valuation range is $99, which means Apple could trade within this range for a year, two years, three years. When would I love to buy Apple if it's down at $99? Because I know the upside could be over 50 or 80% because of the ranges. But as time progresses, as new earnings report come out, you also have to update your model for the new financial information, right? So this is a continuing process where you build the model and then once a quarter, you come back and you update the model. And then you reassess the situation, you reevaluate your investment thesis, um, and then you decide whether you want to own the stock or you want to trim some or you want to buy more. But you have to understand this methodology. I, I tell all of my students, this is a life skill. This is not just if you want to work in investment banking. It's not just if you want to work in private equity or at a hedge fund. This is for you to do your own personal investments as well and maybe give you an advantage over the average retail investor. So I hope that answers your question, Ryan. Yeah, it does. Okay. Uh, let's see. Ulysses, you mentioned technology rotation. How will technology be hot again, given the economic circumstances going on right now? Well, that, that's, that's a good question, Ulysses. Look, what drives the market, it's growth. At the end of the day, what drives a stock price is growth. So if you have stocks that are growing faster than another industry, those stocks are going to grow higher. So you also have to take into account the interest rate environment, right? Because when a lot of the companies that are growing rapidly, they're usually burning a lot of cash, and this could be tech companies that are not profitable. It's a, higher, uh, it's a higher risk of an investment. So if the interest rate environment, let's say the Fed, if the Fed has an economic environment or period where their Fed funds rate is, let's say, 25 basis points, which that's what it was for quite some time. That means that these high-growing companies that are burning through a lot of cash can borrow money very cheaply to fund the growth, or they can raise capital from other investors to continue to fund their growth. So the cost of borrowing money, the cost of funding growth is cheaper. Therefore, your price, for, for companies you know, that are profitable, they have a bigger piece of the pie. They're more profitable. If we get into an economic environment where you have runaway inflation, where now you have to pay more money for your employees, right? That means that your operating income will probably be lower because of your salaries. If salaries increases, that means that you have to pay more. Your expenses go up. So you become less profitable, which ultimately impacts your net income, your earnings per share, and the market will reflect that number, right? So the stock valuation does have to come down. So once you first understand that scenario and, and you understand how at the macro interest rates does influence the stock market, then you have to ask, okay, in what environment is technology usually favorable? Technology is usually favorable 
when we are going into a lower interest rate cycle because many high growth tech stocks that are losing money, they need to raise money still to, to continue funding their growth. So investors, they could go out and borrow money cheaply and invest it in tech stocks. So if we're going into an interest rate environment where the Fed says, hey, look, we're going to have to start raising interest rates because we need to jumpstart the economy again, then you're going to see technology stocks outperforming. That's not the situation that we have right now. In addition, there might be some tech stocks that will still continue to perform well, even in a rising interest rate environment. These are the companies that are profitable. It could be the Amazons of the world. It could be the Shopify's of the world um, after we go through this rate interest rate cycle that the, that the Fed has embarked on. So you really have to understand interest rate cycles and how different sectors of the economy perform and behave in different rate cycles. Um, so when do I anticipate tech to be hot again? Once the Fed stops raising uh, uh, interest rates. I don't know if it's going to be in the next hike. I don't know if it's one or two more rate hikes, but maybe throughout this year, technology stock will probably find a bottom and maybe next year, right? We'll, they'll probably come back into, into favor. Um, that's my forecast, right? And I could still be wrong, right? I could still be wrong on that forecast, but I do hope that kind of gives you some insight into how I think about it and how other money managers that are active on the market think about it as well, okay? Uh, I see another questions here, here from Yay. Does the rise in retail investor after the significance of fundamentals, okay? Uh, wait, uh, let me try to see if I understand this right. So does the rise in retail investors affect the significance of fundamentals? So that's one, number two. How would you value stocks like GameStop, AMC, uh, Revlon? Okay, so that's two questions. So. The rise of retail, does it really influence stocks, I guess, at the, fundament at the fundamental level? Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily so, because usually retail investor comes to the party late. Uh, if you look at our stock phase model, okay, again, on our site, I explain that very clearly here. Retails usually the late comers, right? And they're buying stocks at the top, okay? Usually they're not the one riding it all the way uh, to the upside. Um, having retail investors, you know, they do have a bid in the market. They can actually influence some stocks, but they're not gonna have, I think that much bid because of the level of sophistication. Um, usually retail is not the more, it's not the smartest investors. They're usually not sophisticated. And through every market cycle, every market bubble, retail is usually the one that gets penalized and gets burned. So retail does not have an impact on, on the fundamentals, if, if you were to ask me, just based on the thought process that I just given you. In terms of how do you value a company like AMC? Let's pull up the chart of AMC. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th th this is just like a poster child of what happened during bubbles. You know, the people that bought here, you know, at, at $10 or so, if they were smart, they probably got out of the stock maybe at $40 or $30 and made some money. The ones that bought at 60 or 70, they got sucked into the mania of AMC are usually the late comers, right? And many of them are probably holding this type of stock. So your second question in terms of how would I value something like AMC? Well, quite simple. Let's take a look. What is AMC sales projection? And we could do this right here quickly. Right. Let's see. So here we have AMC. Look at the revenue growth year over year. I mean, two two point four percent in twenty eighteen. Then one point five percent in twenty nineteen. Then in twenty twenty, okay, we got a big jump, thirty one point eight percent. Well, why is that? Then you have to go ahead and do your due diligence. Read all the company press releases for that year. What was the changing product? Maybe it was a movie theater. I, I'm not too familiar with the business model. I'm familiar with the business model, but I don't know exactly what they introduced in 2020 to generate 31% in revenue. But then look what happened in 2021. Revenue increased 3.2%. Then in 2022, it's expected to increase by 14%. Uh, I'm sorry, 11%. Then flat. Then we go 
is this, uh, no, this is not the same stock. Let's see, AMC Theater. Is that the actual name of AMC? AMC Entertainment Holding. Okay. So let's see the financial pro profile of AMC. Wow, look at this. Okay, 7.5%, 20 basis points, negative 77% growth in 2020. Then the stock double revenue. Okay, then it's up 74%. Then it's up 18% in 2023 and then 2024. Okay, so we would do sales uh, valuation on this name. Okay, but then look at the bottom line. Look at EBITDA. For a couple of years, they were losing money. Now they're back in the green. They're profitable on an EBITDA basis. But then look at the net income. Net income, negative, negative. This is concerning to me that they have negative net income. Revenue is growing. They have positive EBITDA, but why is the net income negative? That is a big red flag to me. Um, if I'm being disciplined, I would not invest in a company that has negative net income. So I will probably stay away. But if you want to see the analysis on this, let's pull it up quickly. Let's try to do this uh, very rapidly. Okay. So 2020, what was the revenue growth for 2020? 1242. 2021, 2527. 2527. Uh, 2022 is estimated to be 4401. Then 5195. Then 2024, 5310. Look at the revenue growth. Uh, we're not going to calculate anything relating to earnings per share. So let's get rid of that. The stock price of AMC is what? $13.65. What would be then the revenue growth? Okay, one to one. Let me take a quick look at their balance sheet profile, which you can see it right here. There it is, All right? So cash and equivalents and then total debt. So cash and equivalents is 11.64.9, 1.1 billion. And then total debt is 10.775.4. How many shares are sent in half? 516.8. Okay. And are we calculating this correctly? Okay. What is the current sales multiple of AMC? On an LTM basis, the sales multiple is 5.2. If I change this to 5.2, look at the stock price that we get, $33. What is the current share price? $13. Okay, now this is where it gets interesting. And again, this is an, not an exact science. There's an art component to this. So we have a stock with AMC that is growing revenue single digits beyond 2023. We have a stock where their net income, it's negative. Equity holders, as a stock shareholder, your claim is to net income. And if the company is losing money over the next three years, you have claims to nothing. In the event of bankruptcy, the equity will go to zero. So this is a higher risk stock. If we just do a sales multiple valuation, right? And using 5.2, okay, I see that the stock should be trading around $30 a share, $30 a share, just based on this. But I now understand other factors, which is net income, it's negative. So it becomes more riskier. Then how do you account for that risk? Here's my, here's my discount rate. We could have this discount factor, right? And that discount factor for something like an AMC, we will have to calculate WAC. But to play devil's advocate, let's just discount it by 20%. Now look at the implied stock price if we discount 33 if we discount it at a 20% rate, the stock price now becomes $28. If we discount it by 2025, the stock price of $38.76 become $22.44. So is there a scenario where the stock can double from here? Yes. But what's the catalyst? Why would the stock double? It will not double because they're growing revenue at 2 or 7% in 2024 to 2025. This would be more of an event-driven strategy. What piece of news, what piece of deal, what catalyst is around the corner that
that it's going to attract new investors to buy the stock and take it to maybe $30 a share. So this is not a long-term investment strategy. You will be basically placing a bet on a high risk um, company that is losing money on the net income side. Personally, for my own investment strategy, I would not invest in this. There's other opportunities, um, better companies out there that you could probably do this analysis and, and put your hard earned money on. But I, I wouldn't put it on AMC. I, I was, me personally, I will stay away, right? So I hope that answers your question. Um, and we would do the same thing for a company like GameStop. Another one, right? Another stock. We would do the exact same thing for GameStop. And the revenue profile, the financial profile for a GameStop, what does it look like? Look at this, same thing. <laughs> GameStop has been losing money since 20, 2019. They've been losing money over the last four years and it's expected to continue to lose money. So why would I buy even GameStop? My time is way more valuable than analyzing this. I, I, I wouldn't look at it. One of the pitfalls of retail is that they focus on meme stocks that are losing money because they're cheap and they think that they're looking at the stock like a lottery ticket. It was the same situation that I was in when I first started when I was in college, looking at the stock market. I was looking for the next stock that was going to make me a millionaire as a lottery ticket. And I can tell you that is a fast way to the poorhouse because you could keep repeating that same process for 10 and 20 years. Focus on good quality companies, learn the fundamentals, learn the professional skill set so that you can improve your, your odds on betting on the right companies. All right. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, anything else? Okay. All right, folks. Well, <clears throat> I hope, you know, all of this kind of gives you some practical uh, uh, knowledge in the sense of how you can apply sales multiples, EBITDA multiples, just to simply come up with a price target on the company. But also more importantly, how do you perform due diligence, right? What is the uh, stock market cycle? Where are we at right now? And is it the right environment to, to start placing bets in technology? This is all part of your analyst education. Um, and the last thing I'll leave you is for those of you that are not part of our program, uh, if you're looking to learn more, just go to our website, right? RomeroMentoring.com. And I highly encourage you, if you're just looking to learn stock analysis, look at the starter program. The career program, this is for students that want a career in finance. They want six-figure uh, uh, salaries after they complete it by working at top-tier investment banks or even hedge funds or private equity firms. If you just want to improve your investing skill set or even look at this as a continuing education program, take a look at what we have to offer uh, in our starter program uh, list. All right.